get to talk about good news today. And I like that. We're in the Gospels in our journey through the, the, the Bible. We've gone through the Old Testament. We started out in the New Testament. And my plan is to continue to go through the Bible until we reach the, uh, the book of Revelation, sharing two messages from each book of the Bible. And so today we get into the second Gospel that we find in the New Testament. That is Mark. Mark is an exciting book to read. If you read through Mark, uh, you might want to do it standing up and walking around because it's, a, it's sort of a hard-hitting, uh, rapidly moving account of who Jesus is. Mark is different. You'll notice that, especially after making your way through Matthew. Though the, the goal is the same, presenting the gospel, presenting the good news about Jesus, presenting some teaching about Jesus, some of his teaching, some things about what it means to follow Jesus, but the presentation mark is different. Now, many Bible scholars say that is because that Mark drew his material from preaching. Many would say it was the preaching of Peter that inspired the writing of Mark, and they, they actually date Mark as one of the earliest written Gospels. And so it's, it has that feel. It's soon after the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, and the preaching that followed up those significant events. And then the record is taken by Mark and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And as you read Mark, you can't help but feel that. For example, Mark begins with a verse that introduces us to the gospel of Jesus. There's no birth narrative. There's no talk about Mary and Joseph or the visitation of wise men. Mark doesn't give you that in chapter 1. Instead, when you open up Mark and you start to read, it is the gospel. It is a presentation of the gospel. Now, the gospel, as we have just heard, the gospel is about an announcement, good news, a radical announcement about life-changing good news. And I want to say that up front today because I think that, that Mark is a book about change. And the way that Mark presents the gospel is very indicative of the fact that it is about change. It's about dramatic change. It's about radical change. It's about life change, heart change. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about change. And I'd like for you to, to walk through a few verses in Mark with me. I want to introduce Mark to you, especially in the first couple of chapters, to emphasize how obvious it is that Mark is, is presenting a message of change. And if you need change in your life today, if you need dramatic change, if you need life change and heart change, I, I want you to, to really open up yourself to what Mark presents to us, to Jesus. Open up your life to Jesus today. Be prepared for the change that Jesus offers Take a look with me. Let's look at the first verse. I, I alluded to it already, but I want to just introduce you to that opening verse of Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. And, and I'd encourage you, whether electronically or in, in your Bible, to highlight these verses and go back and visit them a little bit. As Mark 1, 1 says this, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now when I read that, Immediately, my response is, this is going to be about change. This is, this is good news. It's a radical announcement. Gospel. It's a radical announcement about good news. Good news. And it is not just any good news. It's the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, take a look. As you go down in chapter 1, notice something in verse 8. Notice, I could read really the entire chapter 1, but I'm highlighting some specific verses and, and encouraging you to go back and to dig in a little bit. But verse 8 says this, Jesus was, as, let me just set the stage, Jesus was being baptized. We have John the Baptist introduced, and John says this, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, speaking about Jesus. So what John the Baptist says is, we're baptizing people in water, but there is one coming, Jesus, the Son of God, who will baptize you 
in the Holy Spirit. What he's saying here is we're talking about radical change, radical good news. Jesus is going to baptize you in the presence of Almighty God. You're going to be saturated with the presence and the power of God. Jesus is able to do that. John says there's a limit to what I can do. I can baptize you in water. It's a great picture. John was providing them of a picture and a message of repentance and life change. But he's saying there's one who's coming that's going to do something radically, radically greater than that. He's going to baptize you in the presence of God Almighty, the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 11. When Jesus goes and he allows John the Baptist to baptize him, what you have is a voice from heaven in verse 11. God speaks and says, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I wanted to highlight that because what Mark introduces us to is that this is not just another prophet who's come along. This, this is not just another anointed man or woman who's speaking for God. This is the Son of God. This is the Son of God who chose to walk among them, who chose to be baptized in water by John the Baptist, but don't miss the fact that he is the Son of God. He is the Holy One. He is the Messiah, the Savior. And to authenticate that, God speaks from heaven to say, This is my Son. I am pleased in what He's doing. I am pleased in Him personally. We're talking about change. How many times... Had those folks who had gathered around the Jordan heard God himself speak from heaven? I'll bet they hadn't. How many times had they come to reckon with the fact that God had visited earth in human form? They hadn't. This is radical. And so we have that in verse 11. Now, let's go to verse 14 and 15. Talking about change that Mark introduces. It says this, Now, after John was put in prison... Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus announces to them again, this is a change, the kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe. Jesus is talking about change. He's saying to them, with a sense of urgency. The time has come. The kingdom of God. Repent. Believe. Change. Now, let's see how that played out in the lives of, of some of the most famous followers of Jesus. Look at verses uh, 17 and 18. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. We're looking at, at fishermen. We're looking at, at Peter. We're looking at James and John. We're looking at, at these guys that are introduced to us by virtue of their, their vocation and their profession. And they were fishermen. And, and Mark's message of change is introduced this way to where it was a radical life change. They were fishing for fish in the boat. And Jesus speaks to them and he calls for them to leave their nets and to follow him and to become fishers of men. Or in other words, to look at life through a completely different lens. Go and find people who need to know me. You're, you're accustomed to fishing every day for fish, but now you're going to cast a different net. Your life has just taken on a, a grander purpose. Your life has a different meaning. You are now going to fish for people and I'm going, to, I'm going to call you to be an apprentice and to learn how to do that. Look at verses 19 and 20. They, it follows from, from 18. It says, When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also were in the boat mending their nets and immediately called to them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went after Jesus. Same picture for James and John. He says, follow me. They left the boat, and they followed Jesus. Radical change, a picture of that for us. 
Now I want to get into the ministry that Jesus did a little bit and talk about the change. Verse 23, look, it says, and this speaks to his authority. It says that, that as Jesus taught, as he would go to the synagogue and they would gather and he would teach, it says they were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because it was different. Why? Because there had been a change. Why? Because there was something that made his, his teaching stand out over and against the teaching they were accustomed to hearing. Here's what they said. For he taught them as one having authority. Not as the scribes. But when Jesus talked about the scriptures, they would gather, they would study the scriptures, they would study what we know as the Old Testament. They would study the writings of the prophets. And when Jesus would teach them, he taught as one having authority. Not just talking about what was in the Bible. For them, the scriptures, the Old Testament. But Jesus had authority in his voice. He had authority in his understanding. There was a change there. And we talked about that in Matthew. That one of the, one of the things that the church of 2013 needs to recognize is the authority of Jesus. Who he is. He's the son of God. In Matthew 28, as he commissioned his disciples, as he commissions us, that begins with a statement where Jesus says, All authority has been given to me. He speaks with authority. It's a radical change. Now, I want to move into a passage here that, that, that I really want to be, this to be a, a, a primary focus for you today in understanding change. It's one of the greatest passages of the Bible that speaks about change. I, I'm a student of change. I love to study change. I love to study uh, personal change, behavior change, spiritual transformation. I love to study change in organizations. It's been a passion of mine for a long time. This is a passage that is one of the greatest pictures of, of change and understanding change that you'll find anywhere in the scriptures. It says this in verses 20, 21, and 22 of Mark chapter 2. Jesus responds. He responds to, to some questions about fasting. You had the disciples of John who were fasting. You had the Pharisees who were fasting. And it was not unusual for Jewish men to fast. during that. Some fasted two days every week. Wow. Wasn't a single amen. I said some... <laughs> Fasted two days a week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I said some fasted two days a week. And you're saying that was then and this is now. So they ask a question. We'll just go on to something else. We won't stay there. But they ask questions. Do you fast? Should you be fasted? Should the, look at this. And, and other gospels cover this as well. Jesus responds. He says something. He says, the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. The explanation here, you have to understand a little bit about culture. In those days, when a bride and groom got married, they didn't go on a honeymoon. They stayed at home, and the celebration would continue on for a time, perhaps a week. And during that week, immediately following the wedding, there was a feast. And they celebrated, and they ate, and they ate, and they ate. And Jesus' answer is, is relative to that understanding of culture. He says there's a time when the bridegroom will be taken away. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church later, as you read in the New Testament, and we'll talk about this when we get to the epistles of Paul, but the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus is the groom. We are his bride. So Jesus' answer is built upon those cultural practices. He said, while the, while the bridegroom is still there, you eat and you celebrate and you enjoy his presence and you spend that time together. He's saying, my disciples are not fasting right now because the bridegroom is still here. Because I'm still present. A couple of things he was doing here. First, he was responding to their question. And the reason they ask about fasting, you can tell in the Gospels that they're trying to stir something up. They didn't really want a, a direct answer necessarily. They were just trying to find something to, to stir up against Jesus. 
But he answers that directly, first of all, to, to respond to their accusations about fasting. But secondly, I believe Jesus was trying to help them understand the bridegroom. I am the groom. And my followers are the bride. He's trying to help them understand something about the relationship between the church and God. It's a picture that's painted all through the Old Testament that we, the people of God, are the bride of God. That He loves us with, with that kind of marriage covenant type of love. And you see that in the Old Testament over and over. So Jesus was revealing Himself this radical change that I am present as the bridegroom with you. This is a time to enjoy my presence together with my followers because they were failing to do that. They were, the scribes and the Pharisees were struggling with the change that this could be the Son of God in our midst. This could be the bridegroom. This could be the promised one. They were struggling. They didn't enjoy his presence there. Jesus said, this is like the time of feasting and celebration. You should embrace and enjoy my presence here. But they, they struggle to do that. Now, here comes the description about change that I want us to focus our attention on. He says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine burst the wineskins and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put in new wineskins. Jesus teaches a lesson about change here. Jesus says some things about change and he uses two common illustrations to help them to understand. The first one being that of trying to patch a damaged piece of clothing with a patch and failing to realize that if you put a piece of, of cloth that hasn't been shrunk on a piece of garment that has, it's a mismatch. He says you're trying to, to patch with new something that is old and there's a mis mismatch there. There has to be change involved. There has to be a match. It's made more clearly, uh, the point is made more clearly with the wineskins where he says, if you put new wine in old wineskins, the process of fermentation, the gases that are released in the process of fermentation will cause the wineskin to explode. And in the process of that explosion, you will lose the wine and you will lose the wineskin. You put new wine in new wineskins. And Jesus was illustrating something about change. He was saying the kind of change that the bridegroom is bringing, the kind of change that I'm bringing as a Savior is radical change. It's radical change. I would use an illustration this way to put it in modern terms. Jesus is trying to tell them, I'm not a Band-Aid. You can't fix what is wrong in your life by just placing me on a sore spot. Jesus is saying that the need within you is so great. The need for change in your life is so radical. The need for change and transformation and forgiveness is complete. What you need is a new heart. You don't need a Band-Aid. Sometimes what we do is we bring our hurt to Jesus and we want, we want to be able to roll up our sleeve and, and show Jesus this area of my life, as, as, as we say in preschool and chapel, I have a boo-boo. The technical term is actually owie, but we use boo-boo. And, and, and if you know anything about children, it's like the floodgates open. If one says, Pastor Paul, I, look at this, I have a Band-Aid, 30 boo-boos will appear in a, in a matter of 10 seconds. Every one of them will want to show me their, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. They'll make up stuff. 
And it's, it's Sunday, so I lie. I say, yes, I see that, yes. <laughs> I confess my sin to you. I, I see things that aren't there. Oh, that's a bad one, yes. We do that with Jesus, though. We come in. Maybe it's Sunday morning, and I'll say more about that in a moment with the text. Maybe it's Sunday morning, and we, we roll up the sleeves of our life, and we say, Jesus, put a Band-Aid on this. Jesus, I want you to make this area of my life better. I have some pain here, and, and you say that you can fix it, so I want, I want it right here. I want you to fix this. And all the while, Jesus is saying, I need to, I need to come in. There's a time with infection that, that, that you need an IV. You don't need a Band-Aid because the, the infection is in your system. It's deeper than a cut. It's deeper than a scratch. It's deeper than a surface wound. And let me just say, our sin, is it's not a scratch. It's not a surface wound. A lot of times the pain we have in our life, a lot of times the struggles we have in our life, a lot of times that, that we want a Band-Aid, but what we need is, is a heart transplant. What we need is, is a radical change. And Jesus was trying to say that to them. He was trying to say, you can't put a patch on an old garment and expect it to work. You, you can't put new wine, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the same old life just to fix a problem. You need a new wine skin. You need a new life. You need a new heart. Jesus was trying to help them understand that, that it's radical change we're talking about. It's okay to bring our hurts to Jesus. I, I'm, I'm not saying don't bring your pain. Don't bring your scratches. Don't bring, but what we need to bring first is our heart. We need to bring all that we are. And then we follow up with that and say, Lord, I need you here. Lord, I need you there. But don't expect a Band-Aid to fix what only Jesus can change from the inside out. The healing comes from the inside out. Now, look, look at it. Here's a warning about that. If you keep reading in Mark, he's, he says in so many ways in the next chapter, avoid this approach. Jesus tells them, if you try to put new wine in old wine skins, you're going to... You're going to destroy the wine skin, but you're also going to lose the precious wine. The gospel is the precious gift of God. We don't want to diminish the power of the gospel. We don't want to diminish the radical change that the gospel is all about. We don't want to diminish the good news, the announcement that new life is possible, that a new heart is possible, that eternal life is possible. We don't want to diminish that with an old wine skin. We need a new heart. We need a new life. We need newness that only Jesus can bring. And the next chapter illustrates that. Here's what happens. Look at this. Jesus came into the synagogue again. If you want to mark, mark, mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Look at it, it, what happens. Jesus comes into the synagogue. There was a man there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered, withered hand, Jesus said, step forward. And then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silence. Now, I want to pause right here before I read the rest to say how this fits in, in what we just saw in terms of change in chapter 2. Here's what's going on. Synagogue, they're gathering. Jesus is teaching with authority. Along comes a man who needs healing. It's the Sabbath. The Pharisees had laws and rules about the laws and interpretations about the rules about the laws and details about the interpretations of the rules about the, the interpretations of the law. And a part of that was taking what God had said about the Sabbath and now they have gotten to this point to where they're hoping to trip Jesus up about what he does or does not do on the Sabbath. Let me remind you, he's the bridegroom. He's the son of God. He's the Lord. 
And they're, they're scheming and plotting and questioning and looking for a way to accuse the Son of God. And what they're trying to do, the Pharisees want Jesus to fit into their old system. They're trying to put new wine in an old wineskin, and their old wineskin cannot contain the gospel. Their framework, their understanding, their, their definition of the truth of God would not contain the wine. And so they're stepping back and they're questioning, what? what's he going to do now? Let's play out the rest of this. They kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger. Jesus ever get angry? Did Jesus ever get angry? Of course he did. What would be very beneficial to us is to see the kinds of things that made Jesus angry. It would be helpful if we would take a look and say, what are the kinds of things that made Jesus angry? This made Jesus angry. Because he was grieved by the hardness of their hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as, as the other. He healed the man's hand. Miraculously, instantaneously, he touched this man who was suffering, and he healed the man's hands. He did that. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Why? Well, on the surface, the reason they wanted to destroy Jesus is because he healed a man's hand. On the surface, but it's much deeper than that, the reason they wanted to destroy Jesus was because he was bringing new wine and they had old wineskins. The deeper issue yet was the fact that their hearts were hardened. Their hearts were hardened. Two things that don't go together as I close. Two things that don't go together. A hard heart and spiritual transformation. A hard heart and forgiveness. A hard heart and a healed life. A hard heart and new life in Jesus. Two things that don't go together. A hard heart and what Jesus wants to do in us. A couple of reminders that I want to I wanna just draw out here as we close. One, this took place in the synagogue. We talked a little bit about the time between the Old and the New Testament, the development of the synagogue. The synagogue was a place that grew up and developed as a place to study the Word of God. Those that couldn't get to the temple or lived out and didn't go to the temple very often, these synagogues were developed as a place to study God's Word. Thereby you had Pharisees and scribes and teachers of the law that would gather around the synagogue. So this event took place at the synagogue. Is it possible to gather around to study God's word in a synagogue and have a hard heart. Just ask him. It's a warning to us. We can come to Heritage Fellowship Church on Sunday morning for the purpose of studying God's word, looking into the, the, the truth of God's word, and, and, and have a hard heart. We have to open up our heart. We have to, we have to be willing to say, if, if I need a new wine skin, I, don't want, I just don't want the wine. I want you to change the wine skin. Lord, change me. If, if, if I need a patch, I want to make sure that I start from the inside out so that this patch is not going to just be a temporary fix that pulls away and fails to serve the purpose for which it was, it was stitched on to me. It's, it's a great picture here. It happened in a synagogue. 
When Jesus healed the man, when Jesus did something good, they began to plot to destroy him. Now, I don't believe anyone here today is going to leave and start to plot to destroy Jesus. We're not planning to crucify Jesus. We're not planning to take him to the cross. We're not planning to turn him into the Roman government. We're not planning to, 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 to go to the high priest with false witnesses. We're not planning to do it the way they did it. Here's how we do that. We don't plan to destroy Jesus. We plan to silence his voice in our hearts. We, we don't plan to crucify him. We plan to, we plan to close out his voice. You ever, have you ever spoken to someone and you could tell their ears were open but their heart was closed? You know what that feels like? So we don't, we don't plan to destroy Jesus the way the Pharisees did, but we can slowly and subtly be guilty of, of destroying the influence of his voice on our hearts if they become hard. Final, final word. Ezekiel was a prophet, and I think, I think with a smile I could say he's a man before his time because that's what prophets sometimes did. But Ezekiel 20, 36, 26 describes the, the miraculous work of God, the transformation, where he says, I'll, I'll take your heart of stone, and, and I'll, I'll do something in it. I'll take that hard heart, I'll take that closed heart, and I will put my spirit in it. I will, I will soften your heart. I will transform your heart. I'll give you a new heart. I'll give you a heart for me. I think sometimes what we need is just to be willing to say to the Lord, tenderize my heart, Lord. A lot of things that make our heart hardened. It can be our own pride. It can be our own selfishness. It can be our own self-righteousness. It can also be pain. It can be scars. It became, it, it, sometimes it could be difficulty. Things that we've endured. But if we want to experience the transformation, the change that comes from receiving God's word and embracing his spirit and discerning his voice in our life, we must have a tender heart to him. And that tender heart comes from, you see, we can't hear him without a tender heart, but we can't have it without him. He's the one who softens our heart. He's the one who gives us a new heart. So let me encourage you today as we close in prayer. Don't let this be the end of the sermon. When I say amen and we go get in the car, I want you to examine your life this week. I want you to, to, to take a look as you read in Mark, as you study these texts, as you look at that. I want you to examine, is my heart, is it tender to the Lord? Is it soft? It, am, I, am I opening up my life to what Jesus is saying to me? Even when I don't want to hear it. Even when I don't like it. Even when I'd rather silence his voice and, and push him away, am I willing to, to have the courage to open up my heart, let him speak? It may mean repentance. It will most certainly mean change and transformation. So let me pray with you today.